Hi, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us uh, uh, today for this uh, ICH uh, a special webinar uh, dedicated to uh, the latest updates from ASCO and EHA 2023. Uh, I'm Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris. It is uh, one minute past 7 p.m. here in Paris. Uh, same timing in Copenhagen, Amsterdam, 1 p.m. in Jacksonville in Florida. And tonight's webinar uh, is dedicated to chronic lymphocytic uh, leukemia, uh, a disease which has been now uh, has become very popular in meetings because <laughs> we've seen some uh, amazing uh, advances, not only in the understanding of the biology of the disease, but also in terms of treatments. And there is an incredible uh, amount of new drugs. We would usually uh, say it is in myeloma where you have drug A, B, C, D, E, F. Here now in CLL, uh, the guys are really starting to compete uh, so we thought to uh, dedicate this webinar to uh, CLL. So uh, tonight's panelist uh, uh, by uh, uh, alphabetical uh, order are Professor Arnon Kater from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Thank you, Arnon, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Mohamed uh, Carfon de Baja from Mayo Clinic, uh, Jacksonville. And last but not least, uh, Professor Karsten Utoft Niemann from uh, Copenhagen in Denmark. Hi, all, all three of them are really experts uh, in the field of uh, uh, CLL and lymphoid malignancies in general, and they have made seminal contributions uh, to this field. So, my first question to all of you, and then you can decide who's going to start. Just give me, uh, I'm a very naive, ignorant uh, uh, in this field. What are your highlights uh, from the last ASCO, EHA, or let's say six months in the field of CLL? Who wants to start? Shall I designate a volunteer? Maybe, maybe I could smiling? start. Yes, Karsten, please. So it's easier happy. for the guy who starts. <laughs> So I would point to maybe two or three different uh, findings. One being actually the CLL-12 trial uh, presented the final analysis here during uh, the ESA meeting, demonstrating that for high-risk patients at time of diagnosis, starting preemptive early treatment with ibrutinib monotherapy does not improve outcome. It does not improve overall survival. It does not reduce infections or adverse events. Obviously, it improves progression-free survival. Thus, we're still back at the old paradigm that we cannot treat early. So that's one thing. The other thing is for frail elderly patients, the GLOW trial combining ibrutinib venetoclax in the frontline setting and compare it to clarambucil urbinutuzumab demonstrated overall survival benefits. And we have not seen that for the last few years to a significant uh, degree in clinical trials. And especially for the frail elderly patients, it's been like the no-go or slow-go patients based on uh, the German definition. And now we see we can actually improve overall survival for these patients. And you might consider this like a dilemma between the US and Europe, because in the US, it's not approved by Brutus and Benetoclax in the frontline front setting. On the other hand, in Europe, we actually have a number of countries still using chemoimmunotherapy. So it kind of uh, represents the diversity and variance in terms of treatments accessible, but also perspective on what is important. Fantastic. Uh, what's the US point of view? And then I'll come back to you, Arne. So I think that uh, the the point is very well taken. I think the the CLL twelve study really ratified the concept that there is no need to treat patients who are asymptomatic from the disease. So this were this was treatment uh, naive patients who did not have symptoms. Uh, the intent was to see whether ibrutinib does change uh, the disease course in those cases, and the results were were totally negative. I think the the other Italian topic is uh, probably in this part of the world we are focusing more on on uh, really 
BTK inhibition as kind of the therapy to go and uh, moved away from chemoimmunotherapy. And I think that we saw at ASCO uh, a presentation where they look into a payers database showing that patients who did receive ibrutinib compared to chemoimmunotherapy had a much lower hazard ratio, I think it was like 0.3 or so, uh, of requiring uh, next treatments compared to, to those patients who got chemoimmunotherapy. I think the concept of fixed therapy versus uh, continuous therapy is, is also gaining traction. And uh, there is an effort, I guess, to try to establish that as a uh, the new model of treatment of CLA rather than those indefinite continuous type of treatment. So that's certainly something that we have uh, seen to be <clears throat> more and more uh, seeing with, with the studies, especially updated studies. And I think that was uh, uh, shown in, in one of the updates, the four-year update of the Captivate study, which was a phase two study, where they look at PFS at four years. And the numbers are holding up Interestingly, with uh, 79% PFS and 98% uh, overall survival by uh, looking at the fixed duration cohort of therapy. Obviously, bad risk disease is bad risk disease, so those numbers are a little bit lower in patients with deletion 17P as compared to the other cohorts, where uh, for PFS it goes down from 79 to 63% or so. Excellent. Arnon, what are your highlights? Uh, well, maybe a highlight before discussion, Sheikh, maybe also a low light is that we have seen these fantastic results. Uh, and um, uh, I personally, uh, uh, well, one of the discussion that came up when, when the, one of the talks that I gave at last EHA was on the long-term follow-up of the, of the Murano study. And actually somebody in the audience went to the microphone and was actually very disappointed with the data. And he expressed, well, with all these new expensive targeted agents, he would he expected to see actually more cures. And what you see in all the studies that have uh, been performed after uh, the era of our targeted agents is that indeed, as, as Mohammed just said, uh, P PFS is really astonishing with, with really many years of, uh, of PFS, but virtually you don't cure any patients still. So most for the discussion for later uh, it's still a disease which is incurable and therefore although we have all these fantastic new agents we still need to think about uh, sequencing ordering and we also i think still have space for uh, novel inventions for instance car t cell or by specific t cells to see whether or not we can uh, finally uh, cure also patients with uh, with refractory disease which still occurs in virtually every patient so interesting so let, let let's let us dig a little bit deeper now uh, into this topic because uh, all of you, all three of you mentioned that this is about the BTK inhibitors, which uh, uh, are really making a difference. So here I have two questions to all three of you. First of all, do we consider traditional chemo immunotherapy? It has retired, so there's no room. And then uh, what I would like to hear from you, and this is clearly very important to our audience, and these are recurrent questions, because when we used to have like a Britannip 10 years ago, it looks like life was easy. But now we have a Britannip, a Calubritinib, Zenubritinib with excellent results. We have now the covalent, non-covalent, and uh, there are also names that I'm not able to pronounce. To be, and you're going to have uh, degraders very soon. Exactly. So uh, maybe uh, you can comment and maybe clarify to our audience the subtle differences in terms of mechanism of action. W what can you say on, on this? Because obviously this is going to be important, I guess, for the mechanism of resistance. Because unfortunately we're not yet curing, curing everybody. So Karsten, because you started. So starting with the different BTK inhibitors and, and starting out among the covalent BTK inhibitors where we have uh, ibrutinib, uh, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib and sanibrutinib at the moment being approved. Uh, what I believe is important is understanding differences in terms of toxicity. And uh, it will soon come a, a commentary in, in blood focusing on this based on a, a clinical study that uh, focus on the weight of 
adverse events versus efficacy. And I think taking the lesson from Hodgkin lymphoma, where we have seen such good results for even young patients, that we need to consider the toxicity. That's really where we are going now in, in CLL. We need to understand the toxicity of different regimens. And that means that for most patients, indefinite treatment is not feasible because the weight in terms of toxicity will be too high. It will outweigh the benefit from a good progression-free survival. Thus, we need to take into account toxicity, efficacy, and time on treatment. And we need to identify the best partners, probably mostly based on toxicity profile for combinations, whether it will be a BTKI combined with a BCL2 inhibitor, where we only have venetoclax approved so far, but we have the next BCL2 inhibitors coming up. We have BTK degraders, as Anand mentioned, and we have bispecifics and CAR T cells coming in. So this, this is like efficacy, time on treatment, toxicity that we need to address. And then one comment in terms of the chemoimmunotherapy. In Denmark, I represent that public health system. And I also did that for my two years working in Brazil, where 80% of the patients are actually covered by a public health system, actually the largest public health system in the world. And I believe we need to be conscious that for patients with IDHV mutated status and no other risk factors, chemoimmunotherapy is actually a really good treatment. And we need to test whether for some patients who have only been treated with targeted agents so far, in frontline and relapsed setting, maybe in third line, a small proportion of these patients might actually benefit from chemoimmunotherapy, taking the lesson that if you have not ex been exposed to a type of agents or treatment, then probably you will have a better response. So it looks like uh, uh, it's not only about efficacy, but this balance between efficacy and safety for you, Karsten, because I guess patients are going to take this uh, treatment for long periods. And usually CLL patients are rather old. This is a disease of the elderly. And older age comes with frailty. Uh, do, do, are, are you on the same line in the U.S., uh, Mohammed? Yeah, I think that that's certainly what will uh, differentiate. And probably this this will be a nice project for like artificial intelligence or like machine learning to really look into the patient's characteristics and try to figure out which uh, PTK inhibitor will be the most appropriate for that particular patient's profile. But certainly uh, we could see that, for instance, cardiac events, uh, uh, then a brutally comes across as probably the least uh, in terms of incidence and frequency compared to the others. Uh, the study, the CRL12, really uncovered that those patients who were on brutally, while they were totally asymptomatic, I mean, diarrhea was a concern, cardiac events was a concern, thrombosis was a concern. So th those are certainly concerns of, of uh, BTK inhibitors. So I think it's really trying to match the the best one to that particular patient. But uh, I think the efficacy is, uh, I would say, moving into ACALA versus Zenabrutinib, but they are very comparable in terms of efficacy. So it's just really the toxicity profile. Now, in terms of resistance, that's an area where you know, once they develop resistance to that PTK mutation C481S, then you start thinking about alternatives in those cases, whether it's, and right now there are no approved CAR T cell therapies yet for this. So thinking about enrollment clinical trial for, for the new generation of PTK non-covalent inhibitors like uh, pirtobrutinib or uh, or others that are emerging there also. And uh, I guess, just, mm, yes, sorry, just one question. It, it seems that in the US, indefinite PTK inhibitor is, is still quite a bit big thing. Is, is that a correct interpretation? I would say that uh, depends a lot on, on the treatment setting, uh, probably in the community setting that appears to be more uh, of the approach. In academic settings or tertiary cancer centers, we tend to really be perhaps more aggressive with the combinations and try to go into a time-limited treatment strategy. Yeah, but, so, yeah. Just to clarify here for the audience uh, that I guess, Mohammed, you were alluding 
to this uh, randomized phase three trial comparing xenobrutinib versus ibrutinib in relapse refractory CLL and small lymphocytic lymphoma published in JCO, uh, showing that xenobrutinib has a higher uh, response rate, but lower atrial fibrillation, uh, better overall cardiac safety profile, and better improved progression free survival, correct? Correct, yeah. That's okay. the Alpine study. Yeah, okay. I have two no, comments just on to that, uh, if I may. So first comment is the reason that we here in the Netherlands at least are not that fond of specifically first line continuous treatment is, uh, as Carson also already alluded to, is first of all, is you do, although the side effects are much milder and not to compare with, with chemotherapy, people will have uh, um, the side effects for a prolonged period of time. And even a grade one diarrhea, which sounds very friendly, actually means, I will tell my patients that uh, in every mall in, in approximately five kilometers from your house, you know every toilet that's there. Uh, and it sounds like a grade one is not that bad. We also have shown in another study that patients taking abrutinib or, or, or other BTK inhibitors, they do still have lower responses to the COVID vaccination. So that's one reason. Second reason is the costs, which is more problem maybe in countries where you have socialized medicine. But the third and most important one, and you started already a little bit on that, Mohamed, is that you, by definition, if you don't cure a cancer by continuous treatment, you will create novel mutations. And, and if you continue treatments, then sooner or later, you will face that problem. And that's why also in the trials together with, uh, with the Nordic countries uh, and, and the Germans, uh, we have invested quite some trials in actually looking what kind of uh, ways you can give uh, BTK inhibitors in a time limited fashion to lower the cost, to lower side effects, and particularly to lower the chances of novel mutations. Excellent. So just to uh, close on this question about the subtle and the differences between the BTK inhibitors, maybe uh, Carsten or whoever wants to jump in, uh, because we've seen now more and more uh, focus, although I think they are not yet approved in uh, uh, CLL, uh, some interest on the uh, non-covalent versus covalent uh, BTK inhibitor, and I think there is already one agent uh, approved in mantle cell, uh, such agent in mantle cell uh, lymphoma. So uh, how, what can you say about uh, this new family? So obviously we have seen trial dates and we are also participating in trials testing uh, some of the new non-covalent BTK inhibitors. We saw data on development of mutations in BTK on pietobrutinib, the one which I believe is uh, the furthest in, in terms of development uh, towards the clinic. And we saw that new types of BTK mutations are actually developed. Thus, it's definitely not a cure. We would not expect so. It's useful for patients with uh, BTK mutations uh, in the most common locus. And we are going to test uh, in a collaboration, uh, large uh, pan-European collaboration led by the German CLL study group and the CLL-18, if it's actually useful in the frontline setting where we will test two different things, having venetoclaxo benetuzumab as the standard arm, we'll test with a peer to brutinib the non-covalent BTK inhibitor and venetoclax is superior. And we'll test whether an MRD guided approach is superior to either venetoclax or benetuzumab or to uh, uh, peer to protein venetoclax without MRD guided treatment. And that brings me to like where, I mean, obviously we need to decide and figure out the toxicity profiles of the different BTK inhibitors we need to test if a non-covalent BTK inhibitor might be better. But the important thing for me is really if we can develop a way inspired by CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, where we can stop treatment and reinitiate treatment because Arnon's patients don't want to know where all these toilets are. They want <laughs> actually to have a good quality of life. And this means that we need to be able in a smart way to adjust treatment for individual patients. And I think that's really where we need to bring it. And then we 
might have overlooked a lesson from the GLOW trial and maybe also from other trials where we actually saw in the uh, Clorambucil obinutuzumab arm that most fatalities happened after stopping treatment, after progression, but before starting next line treatment according to IWCLL criteria. And we discussed that during the EHA meeting, and it might be that these early progressions, so we saw from the CLL-12 trial that we should not start early treatment for patients, newly diagnosed treatment naive patients, before they have symptoms according to IWCLL. That was tested in the CLL-12 trial. But we have not tested whether patients relapsing after frontline treatment actually should start earlier. And that's what we are actually testing in, and have tested in the uh, HO1141 vision trial that Arnon presented on behalf of our study groups during the ESA. And where we have demonstrated that it's feasible to stop and reinitiate treatment based on MRD. That's essentially to restart that molecular re relapse before clinical relapse. And that might be the way where we can actually reduce the risk of serious infections. And, and we need to remember that infections are the leading cause of death in CLL still in the era of targeted agents. So I'll, I'll ask you in a couple of minutes questions about uh, the treatment algorithm and how do you choose in different patients. But uh, uh, of course, our audience can send us questions and post questions, and I'm more than happy to share with you. One question about the mechanism of action, I don't know whether Arnon, you would like to take this, is about whether beside the anti-tumor, anti-leukemia activity, these BTK inhibitors have any influence on the immune system, because one would guess that this would help or uh, disease control over the long term, and maybe what Carsten was alluding to, like a CML-like uh, process, uh, if you want to stop treatment, then obviously you would assume that the disease is being controlled by something, and we are believers in the power of the immune system. So uh, are there any data on uh, the effect on the immune system? Yeah, there are actually, um, uh, and... The a direct effect on uh, other cells and K cells and T cells. And please, Karshna Mohammed, fill me in if I forget something. Uh, but actually, the, the effect what was have been described for abrutinib was an off target effect. So it was not BTK itself, because that doesn't play a role T cells, but it was ITK. And um, you can debate a bit whether or not ITK has a, uh, what, what exactly the role is on in the end on, on T cell function. Uh, studies have shown that if you combine it with CAR T cells, you might see more efficacy. Uh, there's also a study that shown that you get less cytokine release syndrome. So you, it's a bit both directions, but it's an, it, but the point is it's an indirect effect. If you take a very clean BTK inhibitor, there is, as far as I know, no direct effect on 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 your cells. But what we do know is that uh, T cells in CLL have a poor function, uh, an altered function. They are skewed towards effector memory cells. They have some types, but not completely features of exhaustion. But if you take out the CLL cells, the T cells improve, not by not by something else, but actually by the effect that the CL cells are not present anymore. So it is for sure an indirect effect that if by BTK inhibitors or venetoclax or another combination or, or drugs, you can alleviate the T cells from their interaction with CL cells, that might already have a positive impact, I think. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, actually, there is also evidence showing that when when agents like ibrutinib are being combined with, with CAR T cell therapy, obviously CAR T is not approved yet, that you can actually potentiate the efficacy there, reduce toxicity also. Yeah. And so so that's an interesting evidence that that they have an off-target effect on, on, on the T-cell process. I think if you allow me to go back a little bit on the resistant issue, and, and, and this is interesting because when there was a presentation at EHA on, on the genomic evolution of, of the patients who have had uh, been pre-treated with, with covalent uh, BTK inhibitors. And a good number of them actually, I believe was like 51% of those patients had mutations on, on BTK, like the 481S or the 481R or the Y variant of, the, of that 481 mutation. And they were actually present uh, prior to the patients getting pertubrutinib as part of the Bruin 1-2 study. And what, what they saw is actually suppression of those 
resistant clones, but actually emergence of different clones like gatekeeper mutations. I think it's the 474, L474 mutation. And there is also another one, the kinase impair mutation. So, and what is even more interesting is that even though you, you have those mutations uh, at detectable levels of, of uh, defined significance, the response rate was still 88% response. So, so are those mutations going to confer resistance eventually on, on, on the drug or not? I think that's an evolving field that, that we'd like to see more probably as they keep growing uh, and advancing and more mutations develop. That may be a possibility to develop resistance to those type of agents. But, but interestingly, 88% of those patients did have responses despite the fact that those mutations emerged there. So, Karsten, what's your take on the mechanism of resistance to the different uh, BTK inhibitors, whether covalent, non-covalent, and whether you use them as single agents or in combination? Is this going to have an impact? So, obviously, development of resistance is a really important issue in a chronic disease like CLL, where at the moment we don't have a way of aiming for cure. Thus, we either need to have repeated treatment or continuous treatment. And what we've seen is both the venetoclax, other BCL2 inhibitors, and with the BTK inhibitors, it's approximately 50% of the resistance can be explained by mutations in the BTK or in the BCL2, maybe a little less for the BCL2 inhibitors. And the rest is probably explained by redundancy in the signaling pathways. It's actually quite amazing to see that ibrutinib and the BTK inhibitors work that well. Yeah. Because usually we would see that a covalent inhibitor is toxic. To my knowledge, it's actually the first covalent targeted drug that has been brought into the clinic. And secondly, we usually see redundancy in the signaling pathways. So, so that's really amazing to see how well it works. And the proof of concept that it actually works by inhibiting BTK, because that's often what we claim that we have targeted agents, but often it's actually off-target uh, activity that explains the efficacy. But that is that we see the mutations up on resistance. But it's quite amazing to see, and it's been best demonstrated in balance from macroglobulinemia, that even a small proportion, less than 5% of the clone with a mutation could drive the full resistancy. And we don't know whether that's due to extracellular vesicles mm -hmm. transferring the <clears throat> resistancy from the mutated cells to the other cells, or if it's due to something else. It might even be that the small resistant subclone, 5% with the mutations, is able to turn the microenvironment into a supporting microenvironment that ensures that the rest of the clone can develop. And we and a few other groups are currently looking into whether we can identify the microbiome, microenvironment, CLL axis. Because it's been demonstrated for a number of malignancies that the microbiome, the gut microbiome, bacteria in your gut can actually change or interact with the microenvironment for distant places in the body. And it was first during a talk at the NIH, I think in 2013, that I saw these models of mice with subcutaneous tumors that were modulated by changing the microbiome. So we definitely need to learn a lot about both resistance in terms of changing the microenvironment supporting the disease in terms of clonal, subclonal mutations in the disease and interacting with the rest of the environment, including the microbiome. Well, actually, do you know, Carson, that what you're saying sounds like music to my ears because I'm a big fan of microbiota modulation and we are already doing trials in the field of allotransplant, GVHD, multiple myeloma. So if you are interested Let's get in touch and uh, uh, because we do have active mm. drugs, actually. Uh, they are true drugs, these microbiota modulating agents. Uh, Arnon. Uh, okay, I but... just wanted to come back to the toxicity. Is that okay? Please. Uh, Please. I have one <clears throat> question that I struggle with myself with. I don't have a very strong opinion, but maybe it's a bit provocative, but I would like to hear the opinion of Karsten and Mohammed. But with all these new 
specifically, let, let, let's, let's forget about the non-covalent ones. It might indeed be a gap uh, for patients that have refractory disease, as was stated. But for all the non, uh, for all the covalent ones, I think with abrutinib, what we have learned is indeed you have some very cumbersome and, and life-threatening side effects, which is mostly cardiac. And what we also have learned over the years, which patients are actually at risk. So we know from the FLARE study, which is an investigator sponsored trial, but also from the GLOW study, which is a company sponsored trial that patients with uh, already cardiac problems, elder and frail, they have that problem. But if you give it to patients that are younger and fitter, you don't see that problem at all. And my question to you and, and my provocative statement is a bit that we focus very much on which drug has the lowest cardiac side effects, but you always talk about uh, 10% versus 5 or 5% versus 3, where actually I think we should investigate much better in which patient actually is at risk to safely give these drugs instead of very much focusing on a very small differences in the occurrence of that, that side effects. But I know that's kind of controversial because we all like this new inhibitors very much. So I would like to hear what Mohammed and Carson think about this. You know, certainly, uh, Arnon, I think that, that that was one really my, one of my comments about <clears throat> there is certainly the risk is there, right? And and the question is, is this an age-dependent effect or is this a patient who already have pre-existing conditions or not? Uh, certainly in, in the clinical practice, you tend to see more complications with the older patients. Uh, uh, do all my patients who have AFib as a result of ibrutinib uh, de develop it as a de novo effect or a recurrence or exacerbation? Some of them do have it before. Some of them never knew they had AFib before. But uh, certainly, it it I think that when you compare them, for instance, in the Alpine study, uh, you can see the difference between between ibrutinib and, and uh, zenobrutinib in a relatively matched comparative cohort of patients. So, so some of them could be truly drug-related uh, versus uh, versus uh, uh, a particular new new agent. But certainly your point is very well taken, whether those are, does the drug cause AFib or just exacerbates AFib? Or uh, I can tell that in the practice, the younger patients tend to have less complications than the yeah. more advanced age patients. And I agree. On the other hand, I still remember one of the first uh, patients who actually died on, on one of the first ibrutinib trials back, I think it was in 2012 or 2013, who was actually a quite young patient and a sudden death. So, and we have seen also in the FLARE trial that we actually had some younger patients dying where it might have been due to cardiac events. So to me, it really emphasizes a very important point that I want to stress that for health authorities and for pharma companies, we need to request that all trial data are provided in a way to protect data privacy, but where we can actually model, as I think you, Mohammed, also mentioned by artificial intelligence or machine learning, the what are the true risk factors? And just earlier today, I was going through a manuscript from one of my PhD students on modeling the risk of atrial fibrillation for patients with CLL on different treatments and looking at how to incorporate the interactions between the different treatments and different factors. And the factors important for the risk of developing atrial fibrillation prior to starting treatment were significantly different from the risk factors on the different treatments, emphasizing to me that we need access to multiple cohorts. And it should be mandatory, I believe, that companies that get marketing authorization, they release all the data, obviously in a way to protect patient privacy, but release all the data for independent researchers to model these data, identify the patients who have the risk, because in that way we can protect them. So it's really a low hanging fruit, but requires that the companies change this practice. Well, I think Carsten, you're making my life very easy because my hey. next question now is, what is your treatment algorithm in your different institutions, in your different countries, and how would you choose? So for instance, let me give you the example of a symptomatic CLL patient, 73 year old guy, fit, no comorbidity, very active, uh, and no high risk features, but 
you may wish to uh, elaborate on a scenario of high risk, uh, how would you manage uh, such patient? And then we can play with this for the patient who is 55, for the patient who is 85 and frail. So uh, Arnon, let, let me start with you, Arnon. Uh, uh, what so is your a, algorithm? A, a full patient, right? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I gave you several examples. Just choose whatever scenario. Okay, okay. I would say it. frail patient. So I think what is very important nowadays is that, and I think it's it's really a a mistake if you don't do it, is that you check before start of treatment uh, the P53 status. That does not only include uh, cytogenetics, but also uh, the mutation status of P53. And not for now, but you can have a whole debate where the cutoff is. But but uh, if you do it by, um, if you, did, you just have to do it, and maybe the deeper is the better, but it's open for discussion. Uh, having done so, and it's a patient without a P53 uh, mutation or deletion, you should look at the mutation status, IGVH, if it's mutated or unmutated. And the reason I think it's important, and that's also what Carson said already a little in the beginning, is that so far there is no trial that have shown that you have an overall survival benefit with a targeted agent at first line. I mean, at, at one point you have to give it, but if you have to give it in first line, where do you give it in second line? Um, PFS is prolonged, but since this is an indolent disease, which also after stopping of treatment quite some years uh, of, of treatment-free survival, uh, I think for a patient with a mutated IGVH, uh, it is still something to consider to give your patients a chemoimmunotherapy, which can be chlorambucil or benutuzumab. And the reason I say so is that I think toxicity is mild and you keep your targeted, maybe more expensive, but also very effective agents for later. So far, I think without harming the patient. So it's still an option that is to be discussed. If the patient is unmutated, you can even consider this, but then for sure we know that you have a big difference in progression-free survival if you start treatment with uh, targeted agents and as I discussed earlier, I would then choose for venetoclax or benetuzumab, or if available, venetoclax plus a BTK inhibitor to get a chance to give a fixed duration treatment. Okay, so Mohammed, in Florida, uh, you are quite famous to have lots of elderly uh, patients mm -hmm. because everybody wants to retire in Florida. So I guess you have a lot of these uh, uh, elderly and fit, but fit, for instance, uh, CLL patients who are playing golf and enjoying life. So how do you handle them? I think that, that what has really changed uh, in the recent years is the, is the level of, of information available for patients to educate themselves. And so patients come to you with a very good idea of what they want. I think that, uh, again, the discussions typically go around the concept of uh, I would say that that the chemoimmunotherapy is probably not not an item that is discussed, uh, uh, but typically would be more of a targeted approach. And and then at that time the question goes into: Should we try a time limited approach where we treat this for a year or so, and then for two years, and then we try to see if we can discontinue the treatment, or would you go with with this type of treatment? They pretty much come with the good idea about side effects. Again, those patients that, that you you mentioned are the ones who probably have already AFib, who have uh, uh, have been on anticoagulation. So that can make sometimes the decision more complicated. And so, but, but certainly I think that the main question is, uh, what are your goals of treatment? Are your goals to control the disease and uh, have them have a good normal quality of life. We have had cases similar to the one that uh, Arnoon mentioned where diarrhea became, yes, it's on paper grade one, but it is life disabling. So so mm -hmm. it is important to, to, to take that into account. So I think that the important aspect is really what, what the patient wants and, and what are your goals of treatment in that regard. But we have had that 75 year old person go with the time limited uh, uh, intention of treatment, and sometimes we just have the, that same patient or that uh, different patient with that same age group requesting to have a more uh, conservative approach to treatment. So it's really, uh, and I tend to use that scale by the German group also, where where they find some fitness and try to see how aggressive I can be on on in terms of treatment, uh, aggressive treatment intervention, in in the discussion. 
But you mentioned the issue of anticoagulation, for instance. So this uh, parameter, which we know, I mean, uh, at some point, everybody's taking something like aspirin or whatever. Uh, this criteria would be something very important for you to this to, to, to choose this versus this drug, correct? Or yeah, yeah, that will be correct. And and in fact, it it, it, drew, it drew my attention a study that was presented at. Uh, I believe it was EHA, where uh, where actually they look at patients who are already on antithrombotic therapies, and they look at the feasibility of looking at pirtubrutinib uh, in patients who have or patients who don't have antithrombotic therapies. And there were more pirtubrutinib or that non-covalent BTK tends to at least be perceived as having a much safer profile in that regard. The incidence of grade two bleeding event was higher in the patients who were on, on anticoagulation, but grade three or four were not higher. So with caution, I think that the, the comments were that with, with some caution, you can use them. With traditional BTK covalent inhibitors, it's more challenging in those cases. So that, those will be the discussions where venetoclax uh, plus uh, an antibody will be probably the desirable approach in those cases. How is it in Denmark, Karsten? So you could ask, how is the current practice and what would be my vision? So let's current, take both of them. The current <laughs> practices, if your idea to be mutated, you will get chemoimmunotherapy uh, due to the cost and due to the efficacy being similar or only slightly inferior. Uh, compared to targeted agents. And it's actually quite nice to have seen in the Gaia CLL-13 trial that we just published a few weeks ago in New England Journal of Medicine, that the winner for IDHV mutated patients, even though statistically it was the same, is chemoimmunotherapy, giving a higher progression-free survival rate than the targeted arms and giving actually numerically less infections and definitely less cardiac events than the triplet arm combining ibrutinib, venetoclax, or benetuzumab in young fit patients. So were those patients mostly BR or FCR or FR? Or... So it was approximately half FCR and half BR. So it was defined that if you were younger than 65 years of age, you would receive FCR in the standard arm. And if you were above 65 years of age, you would receive bendamustine and rituximab. Yeah. And the difference was clearest for FCR. And obviously, we would all be concerned about the risk of uh, secondary malignancies. But I think it was quite an important message that the infections were actually higher in the triplet arm. So it just reminds us again that even though we love the word targeted agents, it can still be toxic. So that's why I'm actually feeling quite fine about providing chemoimmunotherapy for IDHV mutated patients because it can give a short treatment with a long treatment-free survival and actually can give good quality of life I'm struggling a bit with using FCR. I actually pr prefer to use bendamustine rituximab due to the risk of serious infections on FCR. We have a question here about the risk of uh, secondary malignancies, especially in those patients who are on the younger side. Is this a concern for you? So secondary malignancies is a concern for patients with CLN. They have a higher risk also on population level than patients without CLN. Discussing it with my Australian colleagues, it means that they emphasize more frequent dermatological work up to make sure that they don't have skin cancers. But, and uh, we and others have also shown that upon treatment, the risk of secondary malignancies increases across all types of treatment. And that's probably because patients receiving treatment for CLL have a more progressed or more aggressive CLL, mm. conferring more immune dysfunction, there's a higher risk of the secondary malignancies. The only situation where we can demonstrate that the treatment itself causes a higher risk of uh, in uh, secondary malignancies, that's for FCR treatment for patients for the development of myeloid dysplasia, MDS, and AML. And it's maybe somewhere between five and 15 times increased risk 
but it's still less than 5% of the patients receiving FCR that have that risk or develop these secondary myelid uh, malignancies. So that's the only drug FCR combination that has been linked to the risk of specific secondary malignancies. And just going back to that like vision for where we would bring treatment. So we have to test whether clonal hematopoiesis prior to starting FCR is actually yeah. linked to the risk of developing a, a mild malignancy afterwards. Do, do, do you check it already, Karsten, or not yet? No, we're collecting the samples. Okay, right. But we have to check it, and we have to check it also in the uh, in the Gaia CLL13 trial. We have to develop yeah. this because that's an important question. Not so if we... If that turns out to be right, then we could actually screen the patients before starting FCR. And we could identify the patients based on the translational data that we have that would need a specific frontline treatment. And we could add an early MRD assessment after, say, two, three cycles, assessing whether you have an optimal response and continue that treatment, even shorten the period of treatment, or as we are testing in the HO1158 trial together with uh, Arnon, whether we could actually intensify or change treatment in the HO1158, changing from ibrutinib, you know, from BTK inhibitor and venetoclax to BTK inhibitor and a uh, CD20 monoclonal. So this is really where I see that we can bring the treatment of CLL now, screening for baseline characteristics that identify specific treatment needs, follow patients with early MRD kinetics and intensify or de-escalate treatment yep. and stop treatment, but continue to follow patients with MRD assessments at frequent intervals and make sure we can reinitiate treatment before the immune dysfunction takes over and the patient suffers from these serious infections. Maybe so, I, can, I can add to that or something or? Please, of course. Well, yeah, I think that I fully agree on that. The only thing is that um, that the question is what what is the good way? And I saw also a question in the chat about MRD. Is MRD indeed the best test we can do to to monitor patients? And if you would ask me a year ago, I would definitely say yes because we know that it's true for chemotherapy. We very much know it's true for venetoclax plus plus CD20 antibodies. But Karsten yourself showed actually uh, for the GLOW study that the connection between MRD reaching undetectable MRD for Van I is probably a very different ball game than for the other. So um, I'm not yet sure how we should follow these patients and if indeed MRD is the best way if you go for a stop and retreatment schedule. But what do you think, Karsten? So I think we need to combine what we know and we need to test it, obviously. I would love to have a cell-free DNA approach uh, that could work, but it's not mature enough to use it. And mm -hmm. even just testing MRD, there's this caveat that you need to be sure that your laboratory is actually validated. We have seen both for IDHB mutational testing, for TP53 mutational testing, and for MRD testing, that it's so important that as a clinician you request from your laboratory that they participate in validation rounds, like uh, the ERIC uh, set up for yeah. validation of your assays. And when we developed the Vision Ho 1141 trial, we were actually shipping samples between our two central laboratories, one in the Netherlands, the other in Denmark. And letting them stay on the table until they arrived in the other lab and running the analysis in parallel, checking that we got exactly the same result. And I think that's really a caveat about using MRD or any other lab test to guide treatment that you need to make sure your lab have sufficient testing or validation of the assays before you apply it in the clinic. So can, can I ask uh, all three of you, because we started the debate about uh, uh, MRD, and I would like to bring it into higher level. I know that there is this tendency in hematology to, and we're happy with this because these are big advances, to chronicize the diseases. But I personally still believe, and I assume if I am a future patient, that cure sounds more attractive to me, even at an advanced age. So the question is, how can we envision a cure uh, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia? 
because assuming I, I know we rarely do head to head comparisons. It's not always easy to do combinations because there are competing interests between the drugs, the companies, etc. But how would you envision, assuming you have access to everything, uh, how would you envision the cure and taking into account the quality of life of the patient? Because you mentioned the issue of diarrhea. Actually, even the issue of taking a drug every day by itself is quite annoying to many patients. And we know the issue of compliance has been shown. I mean, someone mentioned CML earlier, and there is a JCO paper a few years ago showing that even in a disease where you cure patient, they have the same life expectancy. They have a tendency to miss their pills, you know, every day, and they will just forget about it. So how do you envision cure, Arnold, or or whoever wants to start? Uh, I I think there's also a new set of trials that, that we hope to initiate soon is... I think with only chemotherapy or only targeted agents, you will not, you, you will control disease, but you will not cure. I think you did need different modalities. And what we have learned from uh, the years that we still did a lot of other transplants in CLL, we know that you pay a big price for um, uh, guard versus host and immune related dysfunctions. But we know you could cure even very chemo refractory patients with other transplants, showing that. CLL cells can be cured by T cells, and the problem that we have seen so far, and we discussed already earlier in this uh, in, in in this meeting, uh, that T cells are negatively affected by the CLL cells. But I think that if you give some kind of T cell treatment when patients are on their way to a remission, you might actually get into a situation where you can get very long-term remissions and maybe even cures. So one of the trials we hope to design and see, and if we want to soon starting is a study where we combined venetoclax and epcaridumab, a bispecific uh, CD20, CD3 antibody. And another trial that we hope to start is a combination of pertrobrutinib and epcaridumab, just to learn whether indeed those uh, those targeted agents with a bispecific engager can help, and whether it should be in the end a bispecific or a CAR T cell that's really open for discussion and debate, since we don't have any data on that yet. So I would say that uh, the challenge of the, of defining cure in CLL, I think we have to keep in mind that that the disease actually somehow has those two phases, right? CLL slash SLL. So so MRD, I mean, we have had tremendous progress in MRD where we have moved from four color, four colors to six colors. And mm-hmm. we have seen that the more the number of colors and, and antigens we target, the we whatever we used to consider MRD negative at four, they are positive at six and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. So so I think that that probably the future will bring not only more profound levels of, of uh, detection of those type of, of uh, uh, MRT testing, but I think that also, I think that we will see an evolution of, of assessing radiological responses in those cases. So PET scan probably will evolve into more of those new imaging technologies where they look at metabolic changes due to whatever cancer-related proteins uh, or peptides are, yeah. are expressed and so on. So so I think the future will move in that direction somehow. But I think that the MRT by itself uh, is probably not, not a marker that will define cure in CLL being such a heterogeneous disease. That, that's my opinion. And just uh, to the, take the, the question and maybe turn it a little around. I've started to tell my patients, my colleagues, my my friends, that we all have cancer. So 50% of all... That's a bit worrying. Let's be careful about it. Because it was also the first person I know who had COVID, which was also Karsten. So so if you look at all men turning 50 and you take out the prostate, 50% of us will have prostate cancer at some stage. Well, you... I, I read if we live until age 120, which is, if it happens, is a good news. I'm happy to take the prostate cancer if I have the guarantee to live so long. But my point is that 12% of all men turning 65 have monoclonal B lymphocytosis, the pre malignant state of CLL. Thus, it's not that important and it's not that much a yes no question whether we have cancer or not. And it's not that much a yes, no question whether we have a cure or not. We need to aim for clinical cure. 
And one way to do that is looking at newly diagnosed patients and identifying the ones having a risk of a serious infection due to the immune dysfunction, of needing CLL treatment. We're testing in the preventer call trial, a machine learning algorithm that we developed, the CLL treatment infection model, finding the 20% of patients with a high risk of a serious infection or early CLL treatment and randomizing them between observation or just three cycles of venetoclax acalabrutinib. Not aiming for a MRD undetectable cure, but turning the disease back into an indolent disease without immune dysfunction, without need for treatment. And at the same time, we are testing patients at time of diagnosis, identifying approximately 20% of the patients that don't even need hematological follow-up, but can just be followed by the GP, mm. with less than a 2% risk of needing treatment within the next five years. So it's really where I aim to go by data-driven medicine, identifying the ones that might need a cure or that might need close follow-up, but also the ones where we should not bother them with this like struggle to get actually to a hematological department and all the concerns that follows with that. That sounds fantastic. And uh, all three of you, I think, uh, it looks to me you are believers in the power of the immune system and the long-term disease control. That brings me to the last part of this broadcast. Uh, and actually, while uh, I was preparing uh, uh, this uh, uh, broadcast, uh, I saw, for instance, at the last ASCO, the presentation of the Transcend CLL004 Phase 1-2 trial of Maralocell for relapse refractory CLL. And in lymphoma, high-grade lymphoma DLDCL, there's now an overall survival advantage. In myeloma, it's a big thing, CAR T cells. Uh, in ALL, I think uh, it is curing at least one third of those highly advanced patients. Where do you see actually uh, CAR T cells in this big landscape? Uh, because at least the patient, they love it because it's a single shot treatment done. And then you have this famous treatment free interval and then they just forget about the disease. Also, maybe <coughs> Kasten would tell them that anyway, you keep something in your blood, but that doesn't matter, you know. So uh, where, where, where do you see this, Mohammed? Well, so I, I think that uh, if you were to go back in time, uh, you probably remember that New England Journal of Medicine case report by the group at University of Pennsylvania, which really showed a case at the time who had failed several lines of chemoimmunotherapy and did have an impressive response to CAR T cell therapy. And, and uh, But when you look at the real world, in fact, the first product that came to the market were ALL with the tisagen leclusel in pediatrics up to 25, and then the lymphomas came. And CLL, we still don't have if we were to look at 2017 as the time of approval, May of 2017, so six years later, we don't have a CLL uh, CAR T approved. Now, if you go to the Transcend CLL004 that uh, looked at lysocaptagen maralusel, which is approved for patients who fail two or more lines of therapy for large piece of lymphoma, transform, or de novo, and also in the transform study showed that it it is effective in uh, patients who are relapsed uh, refractory or uh, refractory large cell lymphomas or relapsed within 12 months and again showing PFS advantage in that regard. So, but if you compare that to transcend uh, CL004, I mean, two different diseases, obviously, but you look at, at response rates in, in lymphomas, uh, complete response rates were overall give or take over 50%. Here, complete remission rate is only 18% or so for, for transcend. Uh, again, patients have been all exposed to, to BTK inhibitors. And, but, so I feel like going back to uh, Arnon's point in terms of the effect of the disease on the microenvironment and, and how those negative uh, 
uh, immunological uh, effects of the disease. It, we can see that that probably is the case in, in CLL differently from, from large cell lymphoma. If you look at overall response rate, around 43%, compare that with follicular lymphomas, over 90%, compare that with mantle yeah. cell lymphoma, over 90%, compare that with, with uh, large V cell lymphoma, again, you're seeing much higher percentages. So, so something in CLL is probably limiting the efficacy now. I think that, that CAR T cells uh, will need something or a different sort of, of uh, choosing more uh, or less exhausted cells, or how do we look into the phenotype of these cells to make CAR T's more effective? But certainly for someone who had failed PTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors, I mean, the prognosis is not good in those cases. And, and certainly this will provide uh, a good treatment option, but responses in the 40%. Now, the good news is the responses are durable. So you can see, for instance, uh, median duration over 30 months or so. So so you don't see a lot of responses compared to, to the other lymphoid malignancies, but those who get tend to have durable responses. So I think that that my gut feeling is that there is a good chance for approval of this drug because of the niche uh, of those patients uh, in need of that type of treatment uh, to close that gap, patients who are double failures of PTK inhibitors and PCL2. But the responses are not as impressive, and that's that's important to keep in mind. Carsten, and, are you more enthusiastic? I'm very much in line with, in, in line with Mohammed. Uh, I, I'm not that enthusiastic, but I'm enthusiastic about us understanding the biology behind what mm-hmm. works. Uh, I really enjoyed two very nice discussions during ESA, one demonstrating that if you treat patients with venetoclax while providing CAR-T treatment, you will fail. Be- not because venetoclax prior to the CAR-T cell ruins the, cell, the T cells, but because T cells with a transport uh, T cell receptor are activated and they develop more BCL2, the target of the venetoclax, and they could actually rescue the phenotype by introducing a mutation, preventing the impact of venetoclax on these cells. So we need to be smart. We really need to use the translational studies aligned and the joint to the clinical trials to inform us what is good and what is bad, because we need to figure out how to release the T cells to make sure we can actually use them. And as a, uh, one of the questions coming up here also, we might be able to use spy specifics for this, but we still need to release the power of the pseudo exhausted T cells in the CL patients. Thus, where I really see the importance of CAR T cells, that's for patients with rictus transformation. Yeah, it's the most frustrating <clears throat> for the patient, obviously, but also for us as physicians to see these patients with rictus transformation that can be so aggressive and where usually treatment does not work. And we need to figure out how to pre-treat these patients to release the dysfunctional T cells. And that brings me to the other nice discussion about the microbiome and CAR T cells. And there were some data demonstrating that if you have received antibiotics within the three, four weeks prior to receiving your CAR T cells, you had a significantly inferior outcome. That might just be because it identifies the patients with immune dysfunction prior to CAR T cells, but it might also be because we change the microbiome and that impacts the function of the immune system. And that's really where we need to understand how can we adapt and impact this microbiome, microenvironment, CLL axis, both to make sure we can benefit from biospecifics, uh, antibodies, and from CAR T cells for CLL patients, and especially the ones with rictus. Okay. Yeah, maybe to echo that, um, uh, the first trial that uh, was done with a biospecific antibody was presented It's a, it's a company-sponsored trial, phase one, uh, by uh, GenMap and by Abby with Epcritimab. And I presented the data last ASH. And indeed, what we saw is that we saw 50% of complete remissions, metabolically complete remissions in patients with rictus transformation. Now, 
that sounds very promising and good, but we also don't know yet uh, how durable this is. So at least we know, and Carson is very right about that, that we can use autologous T cells at least to get patients into a remission, part of the patients, which for now I would say could help them bridging to an allotransplant. If it's really sustainable as a single agent or whether we need to combine it with either PD-1 inhibitors or venetoclax, something else, that's completely an open field now. But at least there is indeed a proven power of T-cell therapies against Richard's transformation. Well, fantastic. We're almost reaching the end of this uh, uh, broadcast dedicated to the post uh, uh, ASCO EHA uh, in CLL, especially focus on BPK uh, inhibitors. Any last word from each of the panelists? What are your hopes to see in the next, let's say, ASH meeting, for instance, what are the advances? What are the ideas you would like to bring further? Karsten. So for me, it's very much data-driven hematology. I'm so disappointed that we have not succeeded yet to join forces between pharma companies, academia, and health authorities to make sure that we have huge standardized data resources available. And we have seen from the development just the last six months in terms of generative algorithms or large language models, that this can be done if we have enough data available to model. And I think this is really a joint duty for health authorities, pharma companies, and uh, the different academic study groups. And we need to share these data, we need to collaborate, and we need to have open collaborations and competitions on these kind of data. And I think it's our duty to watch our patients to make this happen. And that's what I've dreamed to see. And actually, uh, just the week before uh, the upcoming ASH meeting, there'll be a no rips meeting. That's actually all the data scientists. And we might need to bring those two uh, like communities together to make this happen. That sounds very good. Uh, Mohammed? Yeah, I totally agree that, that certainly that is a big gap in terms of uh, trying to get uh, that data. And I would certainly re-emphasize the point of, of really using available technology like looking at, at really artificial intelligence to try to try to characterize better uh, patients and really we talked a lot about personalized medicine and uh, but this will be the best example of personalized medicine i mean two patients same gender same age uh, a different comorbidity so which one is the best treatment for what patient based on some sort of logical modeling there i think that Obviously, enrolling patients in clinical trials is, is always an emphasis, and that uh, is always the right answer in every single discussion. And, and that's the way we can advance science. That's how we got to where we are today. But uh, I think that, that the future will bring uh, uh, the concept of fixed treatment duration and trying to really... Uh, get a good idea before you embark on that journey to see what will be your anticipated success rate and, and then how do you uh, you address that relapse accordingly. But I, I would say that getting more of that uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, technology into, into what we do will certainly be very helpful. Excellent. Arnon, you have the last word. Yeah, so maybe going a little bit in a different direction to make it... Um a bit more diffuse, is the, the nice thing about studying CLL, not only patients, but also in the lab, is that you are, it's one of the few diseases that you can really start and, and almost play in a, I mean it in a nice word, with, with primary cancer cells, which is very difficult in most other cancers. And one of the things that we are studying now in our lab in Amsterdam is the, uh, the different use of uh, metabolism, so of, uh, of energy actually, uh, how to use energy in the leukemia cells and the T cells. And it looks like a whole new perspective, an additional layer of complexity, but also of maybe vulnerability, how a normal B cell and a CL cell differs. 
which I think can be used in maybe in a few years from, yeah, from now, from even, again, different types of targeted agents, not only interacting with the microenvironment or with the genome of the disease, but also with the use, how, how they use uh, metabolites. And I think uh, what we have seen in the last maybe five, 15 years is that CLL has really been a front runner for many biology driven new um, new discoveries and that led to new uh, new uh, uh, ways of controlling the disease and I think that will keep on going for the next year since we can can use this this model so good and that's specifically thanks for all the patients who in, I think in many countries and also with Carson and Mohammed are willing to always give some extra blood for us to to study this and to go to next levels well I think we have an incredible research program for the next uh, a few years, going from all the mechanism of action, resistance of the different agents, development of immune therapies, synergizing with microbiota modulation, uh, taking advantage of artificial intelligence. And of course, mm -hmm. indeed, CLL uh, uh, is really a unique disease because you have access to the tumor very easily. It's not about getting a lymph node or getting a big, difficult invasive biopsy. So this has been really a fantastic webinar and summary. I am very grateful to all three of you for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, uh, but also your hopes for the future. And on behalf of uh, the ICH participant audience, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the patient and families uh, I'd like also to thank you for your efforts uh, to bring uh, uh, effective but also safe uh, treatments uh, and a lot of hope uh, for many patients because although I think CLL is a disease of the uh, so-called elderly and many patients will not require treatment, it's still a cancer and I think it's always... Yeah. Uh, to uh, try to get rid of these nasty blood cancers. So with these words, I would like to thank you again. And wherever you are, I wish you all the best. Please stay safe and keep well. And we'll see you soon in another ICH activity. Take care.